doing tonight another, I'm going to say it's another perk of COVID because I'm always looking for those on the lookout for perks of COVID. We're able to gather from places near and far. We're able to come together as two campuses to host this event without having to make the trek down 74, right? <laughs> well, uh, well. It is, it is wonderful to see all of you. We'll go ahead and get started. We may have folks join along the way. I'm Suzanne Watts Henderson and I'm Dean of Belt Chapel and I am kind of standing in uh, the stead of our wonderful chaplain, Joey Haynes, as I extend to you a welcome from Belt Chapel um, to, this, to this evening gathering. We are thrilled to be partnering with a number of groups and organizations. Um, the Pulliam Center for International Education on Queens Campus, represented tonight by um, Angie and some of her team, uh, as well as the Muslim Student Associations from both Wingate and Queens. So we love this kind of crosstown collaboration. We're doing more and more of that, and I'm getting to know wonderful colleagues on different campuses um, as, we, as we kind of put our put our efforts together to, to stoke this wonderful conversation of learning and understanding and cooperating across religious difference. So I am going to turn things over at this point to Jeanette, who is the head of MSA at Winget, to introduce our speaker. And I want to recommend that you put your um, display in speaker view at, so um, Hadia can then take the lead in presenting um, in a little while. All right. Hello, everyone. As Professor Henderson said, my name is Jeanette Ahmed. I am the president of MSA here at Queens. And I hope that you're all excited as I am to hear from Dr. Hadia Mubarak, who I will bring on in just a moment. But before that, I just want to share a little bit about Dr. Hadia. So Dr. Hadia is the assistant professor of religion here at Queens. But before that, she was a lecturer of religious studies at UNCC and also taught at Davidson College. She completed her PhD in Islamic Studies at Georgetown University, and her specializations included Quranic exegesis, Islamic law, and gender reform in the modern Muslim world. Also, while at Georgetown, Dr. Hadia was a senior researcher at the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding, and Dr. Hadia also has numerous publications a few of them include Crossroads, I Speak for Myself, as well as Young and Muslim in Post-9-11 America, and Blurring the Lines Between Faith and Culture. With that said, I am so pleased to introduce Dr. Hadia Mubarak. Thank you so much, Jeanette, for that introduction, and thank you, Dr. Henderson, and Dr. Page, and Dr. Cobb, and you know, so many familiar people to me. Thank you all for, um, for hosting this event. I'm gonna share my screen um, with you all, and I'm hoping that I can keep this in, um, and that sometimes it will freeze on me, so if it does, I'll put it back on uh, the normal panel. But you know, good evening to all of you. It's really an honor to share this space with all of you. And, um, you know, especially in, 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 in remembrance and celebration of International um, Education Week. Um, just the fact that you've taken time out of your schedule, I know we're all so busy at this time of the semester, it really speaks volumes to me about your, your appreciation for our collective humanity, your willingness to learn something about the Muslim tradition, to learn something about Muslim women. And I really appreciate, you know, you taking the time to, you know, to, to share this space with all of us today. You know, in, in this age of hyper-nationalism, we often forget and, and get lost in our diversity that we lose sight of the essence of our common humanity, right, which, which um, bonds all of us. So I thank you again for, for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. So with your indulgence, um, you know, I'd like to begin with this seemingly unprovocative question, which is, who are Muslim women, right? Who are Muslim women? Are, are Muslim women among the 5.6 million Syrian refugees who are escaping a brutal war and struggling to find a safe, safe place to raise their families? Are Muslim women those women who have been elected to the highest electoral offices of their countries, women like Benazir Bhutto, the former Prime Minister of Pakistan, or Tansu Chiller, the former Prime Minister of Turkey? 
or even the former Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sisei, uh, sorry, not Sisei, this is Khadija, Khadija Zia, or the former uh, Prime Minister of Senegal, who is um, Maryam Kaidma Sidibi. So, or are Muslim women those Olympian athletes who have represented their diverse countries on the most competitive athletic stage? Women like Ibtihaj Muhammad from the United States, or Ruqayya al Ghasra from Bahrain, or Sania Mirza of India, who is considered one of the world's top uh, tennis players. Now, who are Muslim women exactly? Uh, the reality is that Muslim women are not a monolithic entity. Their experiences, their hopes, their fears, their dreams, their aspirations, and their beliefs cannot be reduced to short Twitter length descriptions, as tempting as it might be to do that. So according to the 2050, according to the Pew Research Center, in 2015, Muslims were 1.8 billion, uh, there, are, there were 1.8 billion Muslims around the world. That's approximately a quarter of the world's population. In other words, you know, if we think of Muslim women who are about half of, of, Muslim, of the Muslim population, um, they are as diverse as the world itself. So let's look at some of the demographics of Muslims around the world. Again, there are today over 1.8 billion Muslims. There are 57 country, countries with substantial or majority Muslim populations. And you know, if we look at the largest Muslim communities around the world, they're not, not in the Middle East, right? Which is not what we would typically expect. We often see you know, images of the Gulf, which is a part particular region in the Arab world, you know, is very representative of the Muslim world. But the reality is that region of the world represents a small percentage of Muslims, globally speaking. Roughly about 85% of Muslims are Sunni and 15% are Shia. And there's a regional diversity of Muslims across the world, right? Um, if we look at the, the number of Muslims um, across the world, there are Muslims also in Europe and North America. Um, you know, how many Muslims are, are, are in North America? That statistic is very much in, debatable because, you know, in the US Census, for example, just if we look at the United States, uh, the U.S. Census does not gather data about the re religious identity of American citizens or residents. And so we don't have an accurate count. There are some Muslim civic groups that have argued there's seven to nine million Muslims, but um, the more conservative numbers are three to five million. So, you know, the, the reality is, and I, I'd like to borrow this quote from Laila Abu Lughud, that there is no such thing as Islam land, right? <laughs> So Abu Lughud uh, uh, describes, she's a professor at, at uh, Columbia University. She, she says, Islam is not a place from which one can come. And I think this is really important for us to bear in mind as we speak about Muslim women today, is that Islam is a religious tradition, right? It's a religious tradition that's global. It spans 15 centuries and it spans, it spans so many regions across the world. So we really need to distinguish between two terms, Islam and Muslims. And these two terms we find are often conflated in our public discourses. So Islam, again, is a religious tradition that spans many centuries. And Muslims are human beings who either consciously choose to adhere to Islam or are socialized within a predominantly Muslim culture. So while Muslims individually believe, you know, what they believe and how they behave are not necessarily synonymous with Islam or with Islamic teachings. And a religious tradition, as is true for all religious traditions, transcend the historical, cultural, political, and social particularities of evolving Muslim societies. Um, and so the reality is, you know, there is no singular Muslim experience or interpretation of Islam. The experiences of Muslim women will vary, will, will greatly vary from one country to another, and even within one country, depending on the family's background, depending on the level of education, the economic status, their understanding of Islam, uh, the privileges, right, with which one has. You know, I just, for example, those two images at the very beginning of my PowerPoint, I, I deliberately put juxtaposed, right, when we look at the, the tragic reality of refugees who are you know, fleeing uh, wars and conflict zones, women in Syria, women in Yemen, women in Somalia, right? Um, even women in Afghanistan, to some extent, things have stabilized a bit now. 
um, you know, their experiences are going to be very different than women in the Gulf, for example, women in Saudi Arabia, in the United Arab Emirates, right? And even if we can think to our own realities here in the United States, the experiences of one American woman uh, to another will, will greatly vary, right? Just in one neighborhood, right? If we could kind of look inside the homes of, of, of people, right? Inside the houses and, and you know, their, the experiences, the lived realities of people will, will very much differ. And so, you know, in terms of Islam itself, there's also a range of interpretation and Muslims themselves, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but Muslims themselves actually differ on some fundamental questions, like what are the criteria for salvation? What rights do women have in Islam? So I'm gonna give you one case example. Let's look at female leadership across the Muslim world. You have at least nine countries that have elected female heads of state in the Muslim majority world. So in countries um, where, where Muslims are, are, are the majority, right? We kind of, kind of have these uh, part particular phrases, right? The Muslim world, et cetera. But the reality is the Muslim world has always comprised of people of various religious traditions historically and, and until today. Um, so the first female leader of a Muslim majority country was Benazir Bhutto of Pakistan. Um, she served as prime minister from 1988 to 1990, and then again from 1993 to 1996. And at the age of 35, she was one of the youngest heads of state in the world when she was elected as prime minister. You also have Halda Zia from Bangladesh, who was, uh, was a second Muslim female leader in South Asia in the entire region. And she was elected in 1993 and then again in 2001. Um, and since then, there's been another female leader in Bangladesh, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Hasina, and she's been identified by Forbes as one of the world's most uh, powerful women. Tansu Chiller was elected as Prime Minister of Turkey in 1993 until 1996. You also have uh, Megawati, uh, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce the last name, so forgive me. Um, she was President of Indonesia from 2001 to 2004. And then in Kosovo, another Muslim majority country, you had Atifata Jahaga. Uh, Jah Jaga. Again, I forgive me for mispronouncing some of these last names. She was president of Kosovo from 2001 to 2016. Senegal, also um, Mame Marior Boye, a, a host of women, right? And you can you can read those names. Um, and it's interesting to kind of reflect on the fact that although we've had Muslim majority countries elect female heads of state, you know, in, in our own country, we have still yet to elect a female head of state, right? Let's contrast this with the experience of women in Kuwait, for example. In Kuwait, it was not until 2005. So if you think about the dates I just gave you with some of those countries, right? In the, in the 90s, uh, 1993 was one of the first female heads of state. In 19, it was not until 2005 that Kuwait gave women the right to vote and, the right, uh, and to run for office, right? In an amendment to the election law. And still that measure was fiercely resisted by conservatives and Islamists who were especially opposed to women running for office. So if you think about it, women were not even voting prior to this. In Saudi Arabia, it was not until 2015 that women were allowed to vote and run for office in just municipal elections, not even national elections, right? Um, to kind of think, so these are two extremes. If you think about some, somewhere in the middle, you have other countries like Jordan and uh, Egypt, which are parliamentary, uh, you know, it, Jordan's a parliament uh, has a parliament, although it's a monarchy, and Egypt is a parliamentary democracy, at least um, on paper, right? Uh, they have actually reserved a quota of seats that are in the parliament that are just for women, both in Egypt and in and in and in um, and in Jordan and other. You know, I, I obviously we cannot look at every single Muslim majority country because otherwise we'd be here all night, right? But I just wanted to kind of give you a sample of just how drastically different the experiences of women can be just when we look at, you know, to take one theme, female leadership. So wh why is that, right? What can help us understand the diversity of experience, the fact that you have some countries electing head female heads of state and then some countries that haven't even allowed women to vote until the 21st century. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's faulty for us. It's, te it's tempting to want to, try to understand this diversity through the lens of religion or culture. 
But the problem with a cultural dependency theory that views everything that happens in the Muslim world as a product of religion or culture is that it's faulty. It's actually um, most of the time an inaccurate way to try to understand the, the, the political, um, economic, social, et cetera, circumstances of different parts of the world. And the reality is that they're just a much wider set of factors than simply religion that can help us understand the significant differences between Muslim majority countries. And human behaviors, uh, uh, sorry, human beings' behavior is just so much more complex than to be reduced to a single religious text or even an interpretation of a text. And I think this is so important for us to bear in mind, especially in light of, of current discourses on Muslim women, is that, you know, the factors that influence human behavior, whether Muslim or not, is oftentimes embedded in so many other factors. You know, there's there's an issue we discuss, uh, you know, it's about Muslim women's uh, suffering, for example. You know, there's this kind of public appetite, if you will, for this genre of what Laila Bulughat calls pulp nonfiction, you know, these stories of Muslim women who have experienced tragic abuse. And the problem with the way many of these stories are framed in our collective narrative when we read these stories as Westerners is that we often frame them through culture and through religion. And so somehow we make this connection that this woman experienced this horrific crime, you know, whether it's an honor crime or a forced marriage or some other, you know, or, or incest or something grotesquely abusive. Uh, we, we make a connection between that experience and between the religious or cultural identity of that woman, which is very problematic because oftentimes what we'll find is that the very people who are advocating against that kind of abuse are people who share that same culture, cultural ethnicity or the same uh, religion. And so, you know, if Islam land does not exist, right, if there's no such thing as Islam land, the, what exactly is Islam? So it would be useful at this point to cut, to discuss our common conceptions of Islam. You know, I, I would argue that we need to interrogate what we mean when we use the word Islam. You know, it's often kind of, the, the word Islam is oftentimes used to talk about many different things. Oftentimes we might be actually speaking about Muslims in a particular country, or we might be thinking of um, a passage in the Quran, or we might be thinking of, you know, a historical, the history of Islam, right? And so do we, when we say Islam, you know, do we mean the textual sources of Islam, which are the scripture and the canon of prophetic tradition? Or do we mean the interpretive tradition of Islam, the way scholars have historically derived theology, law, and ethics from the textual sources? Or when we say Islam, do we really mean the normative practices of living Muslim communities, right? And if that's what we mean, right? And if we're gonna evaluate what Islam is based on the ways on the ways that Muslims actually practice Islam, the, then the question becomes, well, which historical periods will we will we look at? Which geographical locations do we assess? You know, will we look at the way Muslims practice Islam in seventh century Arabia or the way Muslims lived and practiced Islam in 12th century uh, Spain, which was very religiously diverse, right? Or are we going to consider the way Muslims currently live in the 21st century? So you know, what I want to point out here is that, um, you know, these three broad categories are really important for us to kind of distinguish. Are we looking, are we consider when we, when we use the word Islam, are we really looking at Islam's textual sources? Are we looking at this interpretive tradition or again, lived Islam? So what are these three categories? Um, broadly speaking, the textual sources of Islam are basically there are two authoritative sources for Muslims, both Shia and Sunni Muslims alike, which is the Quran. Um, and the Quran, Muslims believe, is divine speech. Muslims believe that the Quran has been revealed to Prophet Muhammad from God and that it's not the words of Muhammad, right? This is a, a theological belief that Muslims uh, adhere to. And then there's the Hadith, which Muslims believe are the words of Muhammad. Um, now, the hadith, the canon of hadith can differ between Sh Sh Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims. Uh, in Sunni Islam, they've been canonized in six different collections of hadith. And in Shia Islam, there are four collections of hadith. And I will say that unlike the Quran, where Muslims all agree on the interpretive, on, on 
the, let's say the primacy of the Quran and the authority of the Quran by sh by the sheer fact that they believe it's divine ontology, right? That this is from God. On, on the other hand, there is a wide spectrum of diversity with the way Muslims engage with the Hadith. And it would take too long to try to explain why, but that's because the Hadith were not recorded until after the Prophet's death. And there's a question of how authentic the Hadith is. And then even if it is authentic, and let's say, and they've all of the Hadith that exist out there have all been categorized as either strong, that's very probable that the Prophet said it, or it's categorized as Hassan, it's, it's likely that the Prophet said it, it might be categorized as weak. The Prophet might have said it, but it's less probable. And it might be categorized as fabricated. So there are existing Hadith that the Muslim scholars would say these are fabricated. They, the Prophet never said this, right? Someone, some of one, some of his followers, some of his followers' followers, you know, fabricated this hadith for whatever reason. So we kind of need to understand that, that diversity with how the texts themselves are, um, are are dealt with. And then when we look at interpretive Islam, right? This includes theology, law, Quranic exegesis, ethics, and Islamic mysticism. And even within these different disciplines, there's also a variety, there, there's a pluralism, right? Which is really, I mean, Islamic law, for example, has been characterized historically uh, through its legal pluralism, that you will find different interpretations about the same exact issue. Let me just give you a case example. Um, in three of these legal schools, uh, at least let's say three of the four in Sunni Islam, a woman needs, when she gets married, needs a what's called a, a wedi, which is translated as guardian, someone who's going to protect her interest and represent her interest in, in the officiate, when they're officiating a marriage contract. According to one of the legal schools, the Hanafi school, which the Ottoman Empire had adopted, Muslim women did not need a guardian. And they based this on the fact that Islamic Islam, Islam had already given women financial autonomy. They could sell and barter and do, and, and do whatever they wished with their own finances. Therefore, they said marriage likewise, in which a woman is entering a contract, could be officiated on her own. She did not need a male guardian to represent her. So this legal pluralism historically offered Muslim women um, a lot of flexibility in how to navigate this. One of my favorite books, it's called In the House of the Law by Judith Tucker, one of my former professors at Georgetown University, who's a historian of the Middle East. And she actually looks very closely at court records during the Ottoman Empire and, and illustrates how women, not only women, but the judges navigated the flexibility within Islamic law to try to grant women legal rulings that were more um, basically in their interests, more conducive to their to to what they needed. I'll give you another case example. Um, financial maintenance, right? In Islam, it, within a marriage, the husband is the breadwinner in the sense that he is legally responsible to financially provide for his wife and children. And if he fails to, now here's what what happens, right? What happens if he fails to? What happens if there's a woman who you know her husband is just not paying the bills and not doing what he should be doing? So according to the Shafi'i school, this would be grounds of a judicial annulment. The, the judge could come, so one of the things that could happen if she didn't want out of the marriage is the state in the pre-modern pre era, the state would actually give her money from the, from the treasury. And then that would be a debt that the husband would then have to pay off. And it would be a, a debt that the state itself would collect from the husband. But what if she just doesn't want to deal with this guy anymore, right? She wants out. So in the Shafi legal school, they would say, okay, um, this is his failure to provide for her are, are, is, is a ground for financial annulment. And a finan uh, so, sorry, um, of a, a judicial annulment of the marriage. It's, it's, this is, these legal terms are important. Why? Because if it's a judicial annulment, the woman gets to keep all of her financial all, whatever has been given to her when she first got married, which is usually a substantial amount of money, it's called the mahib. It's a marital gift that's part of the contract. She, she gets to keep all of that. However, if she is the one who is initiating the, the divorce and pursuing the divorce, and it's defined in that way, she actually has to return that marital gift, right? So this Shafi Legal School, again, not to 
belabor this point, but basically said a, a man's lack of ability or inability to financially provide for his wife is grounds for judicial annulment. The other, um, the Hanafi school disagreed, and that was the law of the Ottoman Empire. So the the Ottoman jurists and judges, and this is something Dr. Tucker talks about in her book, would actually let their Shafi deputy judges preside over those cases. So there, there was this flexibility in the Islamic legal tradition that would, again, you know, both judges and women would navigate to, to, to try to make things easier for women. And I do want to say, you know, this is something that's been lost in the modern nation states in the majority of Muslim world for many reasons. And it would take us too long to go over those points. You know, why, why is it that um, that legal pluralism was lost? And one of the reasons is because the law had to be codified with the creation of modern nation states. And so a lot of that flexibility was lost. Even with Islamic theology and Quranic exegesis, you know, Quranic exegesis is my area of, of research. There's never been any sort of definitive agreement that this is absolutely what this verse means or this word means. And in fact, you know, century after century, Muslim scholars have produced you know, so many, uh, so many commentaries on the Quran precisely because of this belief that people can reread the Quran and interpret it according to their own uh, realities and what's going on in their, in, and um, according to the ages in which they're living. And so what is, you know, that, that's about, about the interpretive tradition of Islam. Uh, what about uh, Sharia? What is Sharia? This is a word that's really often misunderstood. You know, in the last uh, few years, in many states, over 40 states in the United States have issued anti-Sharia bills. So what is Sharia? So Sharia linguistically is a path to water. It's this abstract notion of divine law. And what's really important for us to understand is Sharia is seen as it's in a, in a very abstract way that this is basically um, the way God would want you to live your life. So praying five times a day, fasting in the month of Ramadan, um, giving charity, all of these things would be considered part of Sharia, being good to your neighbors, right? And um, so it's not necessarily seen as law in the way we understand law in the American sense. Now, the specific legal rulings that human scholars have derived, again, from the Qur'an, from the Hadith, so there's some room for interpretation, that is called fiqh, it's a different word, F-I-Q-H, meaning jurisprudence. And there's this understanding that jurisprudence is the product of the best human effort that, that Muslim scholars could put forth to understand divine intent, but that it's not the same as divine intent. So. You know, I talked a little bit about um, the portrayal of Muslim women. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of jump, jumping. So I talked a little bit about the diversity of, of Muslim women globally and, and, and what, you know, looking again at just a, one case example with female leadership and female uh, and, and women voting and being elected, um, how different those ex experiences can be. But what we find is that diversity is not captured in Western portrayal of the Muslim woman, right? And in, in fact, I want to share with you the words of the anthropologist Laila Abu Lughud. So she, she uses this word gendered orientalism to describe the Western tradition's portrayal of Muslim women. And I'm going to quote from her book. She says, there is a long tradition of representing Muslim women in the West. Scholars give it a name, gendered orientalism. Pictorial as well as literary, what is constant is that Muslim women are portrayed as culturally distinct, the mirror opposites of Western women. In the 19th century, the depictions took two forms. Women of the Orient were either portrayed as downtrodden victims who were imprisoned, secluded, shrouded, and treated as beasts of burden, or they appeared in a sensual world of excessive sexuality as slaves in harems and the subjects of the gaze of lav lavishes of, of lashivists, sorry, and violent men, not to mention those looking in, artists and writers, and even the colonial postcard photographers of the early 20th century preferred the sensual and the sexual. And here's another image of um, some, of, some of this, right, that may be familiar. So I wanna turn our attention to the impact of this portrayal of Muslim women on the lived experiences of Muslim women here in the United States. 
So despite, again, this long history of gendered Orientalism, there's still aspects of these narratives that continue to emerge in our public discourse on Islam and on Muslim women in specific. So I want to share with you some of my findings from um, a, a research project I did, and I'm going to move on to a different slide and just share some of these. So we we actually uh, called a colleague of mine, Navid Bakali, and I, we both uh, co-authored a chapter, and this is the title of the chapter, um, on, on Muslim women's experiences in the last presidential elections in 2016, when there was a really high level of Islamophobic um, rhetoric, if you will. And we focused specifically on Muslim women because what we found is that, and this is also um, statistically, uh, many, you know, for example, the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding shows that statistically, Muslim women are much more likely to bear the brunt of hate crimes and discrimination than Muslim men. Although in general, in societies, men tend to be the greater victims of hate crimes, generally speaking. But when it comes to Muslim, when it comes to the Muslim community in America, women tend to bear the burden and the brunt of of Islamophobia, if you will. And the, what we found in this chapter, so um, you know, what, what we found in this chapter that was really interesting is that all of the women we, so this is, this is a book that it recently came out just, just in the last few months. Um, what we found is that all of the women we interviewed, we interviewed women from all around the United States, they all mentioned that at the time that the act of the hate crime or the act of discrimination or the incident happened, they were wearing a headscarf. Even though some of those women don't always wear a headscarf, they might've been wearing it at that moment. And obviously not all those stories were shared in the book chapter because there were, there were just way too many stories to share. Um, but what the stories of you know, the, the, these American Muslim women, most of them are American citizens, the majority of, of the women we spoke with, is that they all tell a story of chronic abuse at the hands of a segment of the American citizenry that was mobilized by the new president's rhetoric against Islam. This is really beginning from the 2016 elections. And we really looked at the wide spectrum of Muslim women in the, U in, in the United States. Some were converts, some were um, descendants of immigrants, um, some were immigrants themselves, and they really also uh, varied in terms of their career choices. You know, some were pharmacists, some were educators, bankers, homemakers. Um, so really a diverse group of women. And what's interesting, there were four themes. I'll quickly um, just, you know, t talk about the, the four themes we identify, the common themes that all these women said they experienced um, during the 2016 election, as well as during the President Trump's first year in office. They all agreed that life was made more difficult, right? Um, I remember interviewing this one woman in Tampa, Florida, who talked about how she, you know, she was old enough to really remember um, what 9/11 was like, and she had said that even after 9/11, she said she was she used to wear a more conservative Muslim dress. She's from Egypt, and um, she said that her her work had her commuting, I think, from like Orlando to Tampa or somewhere down in South Florida after 9-11. She said, I never experienced the kind of hostility that she experienced in the last electoral cycle, um, just as a Muslim woman, even though she said her dress was even more conservative back then. I think she wore this um, headscarf that kind of went over the shoulders, which some Muslim women will wear. And um, what our findings actually are consistent with the Pew Research Center's polling results, which found that 75% of US Muslims in 2017 believe there's a lot of discrimination against Muslims in the US. And uh, so in general, the, the, the broad theme was uh, that we heard with among all of these interviewees was that life had become more difficult. Um, you know, the Pew Research Center, for example, you can see here a polling from 2019, um, looking at the perceptions of people who, who believe that there's a lot of discrimination against their group or their, in, in our society. So you can compare here, you know, um, also if you compare, for example, Jewish Americans also felt a lot more um, discrimination in the last three years as well. Uh, evangelical Christians, uh, about 50%, um, so a little bit higher in 2019 and 2016. Um, the second theme 
that was common was the fact that there were unsympathetic bystanders, bystanders when the incident happened. Uh, in fact, some of those bystanders were either school administrators. There was one case that um, of, of a young 15 year old girl here in Charlotte, North Carolina, who had, been, who had gone through so much bullying by her classmates. And she said when we interviewed her that the most difficult aspect of it was the fact that some of this bullying happened right in front of school teachers or administrators who just pretended they did not hear it. And she talked about how, how difficult it was to bear that, that she just wanted to drop out of school. And this is a very studious young girl who wore the headscarf at that time. And, um, and there were other incidents that happened to her by coincidence. She told me of this one story where she was going to the movie to watch Zootopia. I think somewhere in, um, it, it's in, this, in the Charlotte area, I don't remember which mall outlet it was, and the security guard in the movie theater told her she would not allow her in. And he said, I don't know what you're hiding under that, pointing to her headscarf, right? So she had already gone through so much. And interestingly, the people who helped her were her own classmates who would walk with her at times and, and saw you know, and witnessed what happened. And then they mobilized others to, to do something about it. And they actually petitioned the school principal. And she said she found out other middle schoolers from her previous middle school petitioned the school principal. And, and finally something was done. Um, you know, there were many other incidents. I just wanted to point that a, a third common theme among all the interviewees was this conflation of terrorism, violence, oppression, and the hypersexualization of Muslim women in a really sort of ironic way. You know, while someone was screaming obscenities at a Muslim woman, for example, they would call her oppressed and they'd say something like, we don't want your oppressed ASS here in this country, right? And there was this portrayal or, or this belief in the, in the mind of the perpetrator that Muslim women and Muslims are not real Americans. So again, you know, it, it was really interesting to see the conflation of this idea that Muslim women are terrorists, so they're violent, but at the same time they're oppressed, right? It was this really ironic way that the perpetrators of, of these acts of di discrimination were referring to these women. And there were so many, so many incidents, and you know, obviously I don't have time to share because I, I want to try to wrap up. Um, but you know, phrases as you see here, <laughs> phrases I don't even want to say, right? And you know, go back to your country. That was a very common theme, which leads me to um, the fourth theme that we found among all of the interviewee stories was this common perceptions, common perception that Muslims are not not American, but that they're foreigners, and this idea underlied, um, underlay Muslim women's experiences with the racism, hostility, and assault in the U.S. And I wanted to just, again, you know, connect these experiences, the lived realities of Muslim women in the last four years in our own country with some of what I said, because, you know, I talked about the statistical, you know, diversity of, of, of Muslims across the world and Muslim women across the world. And yet when that portrayal, when the portrayal of Muslim women is not aligned and not reflective of that diversity, you end up with things like this. You know, you end up with these perceptions that are fueling uh, these sort of incidents. And again, you know, this, this theme of, of being un-American, there was one woman who was in, um, actually from Allentown, um, Pennsylvania, and she was crossing a shopping park lot with her with her toddler when a truck driver yelled at her and said, you effing Muslim, get out of this country, and then floored the gas pedal. Um, and actually, she thought he was trying to run her over. And it was interesting because she sat in, in the, she went back to her car and sat in the parking lot waiting for the police to come. She was shaking. She was so, um, you know, visibly distraught by what had happened. And the police officer, interestingly enough, she said was so dismissive. And at the end, he told her, you know, he didn't do anything. And if you're going to dress that way, you have to be, um, you have to ex accept for the fact that people will speak. It's a free country. People are going to speak their minds. That was the reaction of one of the police officers who came to speak to her. And that kind of goes back to that first theme. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen here. And, you know, just in conclusion, you know, that we need to, again, as diverse ethnic, racial, sexual, and religious communities to, to focus on that which connects us and not that which divides us. 
and you really, if we begin, can begin to understand and appreciate um, the diversity of human experiences, irrespective of these markers of identity, I think it can help us better understand and, and appreciate um, and one another. And, and, and hopefully, really, what we need so badly at this time is to just create a more hospitable and more welcoming and kind world, which is what I hope, I hope we can all um, contribute to. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mubarak. Uh, my name is Rania Badran. I'm the president of the Muslim Students Association at Wingate University. Um, and so now we just want to go ahead and open up for some questions. Um, if you don't mind dropping them in the chat and then we'll read them out for Dr. Mubarak to get them answered. And feel free to ask anything, really. I, I, I very much welcome questions and, and love to engage. I, I don't like to hear myself talk, so <laughs> I prefer to engage. I really do want to hear from everyone or as, as many of you as, uh, as would like to contribute. Sue has her hand up. I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, so with everything that you have done, So you're cutting up the, the, I think we lost you. Sue, so I think, I think you had a question. Yes. Um, I had a question on the, um, I was interested in the uh, section when you talked about interpretive um, sources, the different uh, legal, um, the pluralism within the interpretation. And I had wondered if there, if, if those are divided in any way um, among the groups like the Sunnis and the Shias, um, or is or or is the, the the division the different schools that you mentioned is that um, broad broadly across um, the the faith uh, across Islam? That's a really good question. Actually, that's an excellent question. So. You know, there's a, there's a lot of history about how these legal schools emerged and whatnot. So I, actually at the outset of Muslim history, um, these schools were encompassing of both Sunni and Shia. But now, uh, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, the Shiaism became more entrenched uh, later on. I mean, obviously the idea of, of Shiaism was always there after the death of, of Prophet Muhammad. As many of you know, it was primarily a political issue at the very beginning. But over, over time, um, now the primary legal school for Shia Islam would be the Jaffrey School, which was one of the schools that I listed. But, you know, what's really interesting is if you look at the way Muslim scholars traditionally, even historically, have, have viewed these schools, is that they were all view, viewed as valid schools, even the Jaffrey School. And so you'll find Sunni sources talking about the Jaffrey School, and you, you'll see this kind of open, broad, um, exchange between Sunni and Shia scholars, which, which I would say, you know, has has unfortunately for political reasons changed more so in, in recent times, you know, where, where the, there's been this more rigid divide than there has been historically. All right, so it looks like we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, the first one was, have you published the research that you referenced? If so, where? Yes, so um, the the book chapter um, that I just discussed, the, the findings from those chapter are published in a book called The Personal is Political. And it was um, the editors of the book are um, actually two UNCC professors, John Crane and Christine Davis. Um, so that's the title of the book. You can find it on Amazon. It was published by Brill. So you can also find it on Brill's website. And that came out a little bit before the um, 2020 election. So I want to say it came out in September, maybe, or October. Um, so the next question was a comment question from Corinne. She said, thank you, I've learned so much. I was co-chair of the Charlotte SOSS and, still am, and am still a member. We have a diverse, um, we have diverse Muslim women, but I realized there was way more than I realized, Saddam and Shalom. And then the next question was, what can we do as a community to make people more aware of what the Muslim community believes? 
I think those are really excellent questions. Um, you know, I today I was having this discussion with my students. Uh, Dr. Henderson knows some of these students are really brilliant students. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, one of the students was expressing how after, you know, reading all the books she's read throughout the semester in my Islam class, how she said, you know, why is it that in our public discourse, like this information is not readily available? You know, for example, today we were looking at Islam in America and just the history of Islam in America, beginning really with enslaved people in this country who helped build this country through their labor and sweat. And, you know, and we looked at people, you know, folks like Omar Ibn Said, who really is one of the most interesting historical figures in, in American history, in my opinion, you know, in that he has written the only autobiography we have in Arabic of an, of an enslaved person in the United States. He wrote his autobiography in Arabic. He was a scholar of Islam, right? Not only did he, Arabic wasn't even his native language. And here he was after 24 years of captivity, you know, writing his own story in a language that was even foreign to him, but that he had mastered as a scholar of Islam and writing passages of the Quran. And, you know, and it just, there's so many other stories, you know, Yaro Mahmoud, whose portrait is in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., the first um, African property owner um, whose house is still at Georgetown. So, you know, these narratives change and shift our perception of Muslim Americans and the history of Islam in this country. And um, I've, I've had a really good uh, time in, in my QLC course where we've talked about Islam in America and, and, and looking at yeah, even the way um, African-American Muslim communities in the U.S. In, during the civil rights era have kind of reclaimed that legacy and that there was actually a clear connection between some of some of the most important figures in the civil rights era, like, Mar, um, like Malcolm X, you know, who had been working closely with Martin Luther King Jr. at the end of his life, and others who, you know, saw their, their um, civil rights work stemming from their religious values, people like Martin Luther King Jr., people like Malcolm X, who you know, I think is, is very much misunderstood. Dr. Henderson, and I like to talk about his autobiography sometimes. So I think we just need to just read more and speak to one another and, and um, you know, that's, and just do what you're doing here by, by, by sharing the space. Awesome, so the next question we had was, um, could you elaborate a bit more on what is power problematic about using social identity to predict outcomes for people or countries so like muslim countries are x or muslim women act y way what are better predictors that's a really good question right and i talked about that framing and we tend to have this framing when it comes to a community that is different than our own right and when we're trying to understand why a certain problem is prevalent in a certain community that is not our own, we, for whatever reason, I don't know what, you know, it's this human tendency that we unfortunately resort to sometimes the most outward visible aspects that we see, whether it's skin color or race or, you know, religion or the fact that, you know, they're immigrants, um, et cetera. And this framing is very problematic because it's ignoring much more important factors that are actually influencing the lives of people political factors, socioeconomic factors. When we we're looking at the United States, for example, you know, institutions of, of structural racism, the way that's affected, you know, our African-American brothers and sisters, right? I mean, even that, you know, unfortunately, there's been a long history in America of looking at this through the prism of race, you know, that it's somehow a race problem when it was really the fact that it was this institutional racism, right? That then bred these other factors. So, um, there, it, it's, it's so much more complex um, and I think I think we all we all need to work collectively to kind of interrogate the frames that we ourselves buy into sometimes you know and I, I think we can all I, I always say this to my students you know I think we can all sometimes subconsciously be guilty of that you know including myself um, where and until we catch ourselves and think like okay why am I making this assumption right about this person um, so I, I hope that's helpful. Okay. The next question we had was, how would you recommend people act as allies and supporters to combat ignorance and help educate about the realities of Muslim women and their diverse experiences? So, uh, sorry, Rania, you said, how can people ally with the Muslim community? 
act as allies and supporters to combat ignorance and educate for like this moment. Yeah, and I know, I think, um, was it Corrine who mentioned that she's been meeting with um, Doreen, Doreen, Doreen Alama is a friend of mine. Um, I think, you know, interfaith efforts, I know Dr. Henderson's been working very hard in the community of Charlotte to work on interfaith uh, dialogue and interfaith engagement. I can't, you know, emphasize how important that is because the reality is faith is important to so many people and um, and that needs to needs to happen. I would also say that, you know, going back to the research that we did um, on Muslim women's experiences in the last electoral cycle, they, they did say, you know, how those women we interviewed who experienced discrimination, they talked about how meaningful it was to have someone there who witnessed it, stand up for them, or even say something. I remember there was a pharmacist we spoke to, her story didn't end up in, in the chapter, but she said, um, a clutch is a pharmacist, a client came up, a patient, you know, to pick up his medicine and he refused to interact with her. And he said, I want to talk to the manager. I don't remember, I don't remember the details of the story, but he said, you know, how can you have someone looking like her work here? And the manager was apologizing to the, to the client, like, instead of standing up for this, her, her own employee. So she said another employee came to her and said, like, that's outrageous. And, you know, you should not have to deal, you should not have to deal with that. And she talked about just how meaningful it was to have someone else there validate her experience and acknowledge how hurtful, you know, and painful it was for her to be ostracized and, 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 and to be dealt with in a way that, you know, assumed she was not worthy of being a pharmacist because of her headscarf, you know, because of a piece of cloth, right, that she's wearing for religious reasons or whatever reasons, um, you know, whatever reasons they may be, that, you know, she was somehow seen as, as, as not worthy of this career. So I think that that would be really important, you know, is to when we when we witness something to 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 really stand up for for the person who is being uh, victimized at that moment. Um, okay, so the le next question is a little more personal, but as a Muslim woman, have you personally experienced any prejudice like many others? And if you did, how did you handle it? Oh, thanks, Agul. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly. Um, I, yes, so you I are. Okay, so I grew up in, um, in the Bible Belt, and my experiences there, you know, obviously are, are, can't be summarized in just one way. I had some good experiences and then some not very good experiences. I remember when I decided to put to wear a headscarf, you know, um, oftentimes hearing things like raghead, you know, terrorists, go back home. I was born in New Jersey, so it's like, where do you want me to go? Do you just want me to go back up north, right? <laughs> like, instead of being in the south, I grew up in Panama City, Florida. So, um, it, I, I think I told Dr. Henderson's class about this. I remember when I went to Georgetown University in 2003 to start my graduate school, had the most bizarre experience because I was in DC. I was uh, jogging down M Street. If anyone has been to M Street, it's a very diverse, very sort of, you know, cosmopolitan place to be. And I had someone, and this was in 2003, so two years after 9-11, I had someone scream at me and say, what are you training for jihad? And then they ran away. And I remember being so shaken because here, here I was, a female running in, in it was in the it was like around sunset or, or past sunset, you know, running in the dark and just the most bizarre thing that someone would think I'm a I'm a terrorist training for jihad, you know, and obviously jihad is not terrorism, right? And that's a whole different discussion, but that's that that was the implication of that statement. So um, you know, how do I handle it? I think it depends on my mood <laughs> at the time. I mean, I try to brush it off, you know, I try to brush it off. Um, uh, but it's it's difficult, and I've, I've I've talked more frankly about the fact that there have been times in more recent years that I have been scared, um, especially, you know, I was teaching last year, the last two years at Guilford you know, uh, College in Greensboro, and I was communing back and forth, and sometimes would have to go through small areas and you know especially when especially when after there's an incident in the united states so if there is a, a terrorist attack either, either you know in the u.s or outside the u.s and the perpetrators or the terrorists are part of the muslim faith you know that is a time when i expect there to be backlash against people who look like me and those are times that i do actually feel scared and try to just minimize going out out if i can 
wear a cap, you know, I'll wear like my husband's uh, Dallas Cowboys <laughs> baseball, you know, like just uh, something that, you know, people might like relate to, you know, <laughs> some NFL team or NBA team and just try to, to lay low um, during those times. Okay, it looks like we have, this is our last question. Um, I had never heard of the hypersexualization of Muslim women, but no, this happens to many women who don't fit the U.S. dominant narrative of women. Where do you think that stems from and what purpose does it serve? That's a really good question. Um, I think those ideas come from, you know, even back when we look at, we, when we look at Europe and European encounters with the Muslim world, that was sort of uh, one of the images, one of the themes about Muslim women that um, was often used in a lot of the literature, et cetera. And, and you know, that's not really my area of research, but there are historians that have looked at why and how that has that perception came to be by Europeans visiting the Muslim world. So, for example, you have this um, you can, you have this um, Al, uh, French um, administrator in Algeria. Uh, in in the 18th between the 18th and 19th century, you know, who had encounters with like a specific type of Algerian woman, and then use that encounter to kind of generalize a lot about this, you know, this the fact that you know it was the debauchery, right, of Arab women, and and it was all really just based on this very small sample of what he had actually encountered in Algeria. So, um, and, and yet he was a French uh, colonial administrator. And so he wrote a book about his encounters and, you know, those books are then read and consumed. And so part of it is also the power dynamics, right? And who gets to speak and portray which communities. Thank you so much, Dr. Henderson. Um, I don't know if Dr. Henderson is still on. I know she uh, did, did want me to say something about the classes I'll be teaching in the fall, in the spring semester. So I'll just quickly mention that I will be teaching a course on Muslim women. Uh, it's called Women and Gender in the Muslim World. Um, this is gonna be a cross-listed course with political science and religious studies, obviously philosophy and religious studies. Um, and obviously we'll be looking at a lot of academic, um, you know, looking at the subject from, a, from an academic lens. Um, the QLC courses, I think those those are what they are, but they I don't know if uh, we have any anyone here who could sign up for a QLC course, so I'll skip that. But if anyone's in, if we have any students uh, with us and would be interested in any of those courses, you know, please please reach out to me and I'll be happy to share a syllabus. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Joey, I know is having technical issues, so. Um, Jeanette or Rania, did any of you or, or Dr. Page or Angie, anyone want to say any final words about any programs or anything that you're doing? I will just extend my thanks to you, Dr. Mubarak, for doing this talk. I think we all agree it's been really interesting and really engaging. Um, I appreciate everyone who collaborated on this event as part of International Education Week, but we're glad that all of you are here. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you, Angie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mubarak. It was wonderful. Very, very enlightening. Thank you, Dr. Halstead. Thank you all so much for joining. Great. Everyone take care. Have a good night. I think I'll close it out then. Thank you very much. Have a good I, wanted, I wanted to thank Dr. Um, Hadia as well. It was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Zahra. Sorry, I can't see your full last name, so I hope you don't mind me calling you by your first name. No, it's fine. Absolutely fine. Which means flower, by the way. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. Thank you so everyone. much. Have a good evening. Bye. Have a good night.